Take me, Jesus, take me now. Good morning. <laughs> it's good to see everyone here this morning. Um, I'm Haley, and I'm not Frank. Uh, he is in Kansas today with his family, meeting a brand new grandbaby. I believe, what did he say? Is it the 12th or the 13th or the 14th? or the 23rd grandbaby for the pennas, but this is um, the first little penna boy. Um, and so he, was, he and both Aunt Janet are super excited to be there. So um, neither Mary nor I knew who was in charge of our meeting back there, so we were sitting there for about 15 minutes before one of us realized that we were waiting on each other to get the meeting started, which is why we're a little bit late this morning. So that's what happens <laughs> when we've got two leaders in the service. So um, we're going to start out with a bang. Are you ready? If you are a child or even a child at heart, you have a job for us this morning. We need you to do some motions for us for a song that you all know. And if you don't know it, you'll learn it really fast. Okay. So if you are a kid in kindergarten through fifth grade, would you come and stand up here because we are going to need you. Can you come up here? We're going to sing a song called I Get Down, and it has some really important movements that we need to watch you do so that everyone else can learn how to do these movements. And if you can't do them out here, you can enjoy the motions going on. <laughs> come on up. They're real easy. Everyone can do them. In fact, would you show us how they go? Those of you who already know them. What do you do when you say, I get down? Yeah. And he lifts me up. That's it. Hands way up high. He lifts me up. I get down. He lifts me up. Yep, we do that a lot. So we'll be doing that motion a lot. There's one part of the song that says, I get down. I get down. Okay? That is jam time. Okay, freestyle dancing. You're getting a little taste of what we get at Awana on Wednesday nights, just so you know. We do this on Wednesday nights, and it's a great time. Um, so they just get down. That's freestyle dance move time. Yep, we got to see what you got. All right? And the rest of us, if this makes you tired, you can sit. Uh, you can stand. You can do the motions with us. You're free to do as you would like this morning. For me, it's hard to sing this song sitting down, I'm just saying. But. I get down, he lifts me up, I get down, he lifts me up, I get down, he lifts me up, I get down. I get down, he lifts me up, I get down, he lifts me up, I get down. He lifts me up, I get down. Good, we're gonna do that again. I get down. He lifts me up, I get down. He lifts me up, I get down. He lifts me up, I get down. I get down. He lifts me up, I get down. He lifts me up, I get down. He lifts me up, I get down. I get down, he lifts me up, I get down, he 
Guys, go ahead and find your seats. They do, they do a little bit more um, with the jam time when we're at Iwana, if you can imagine. It's quite a sight. Now, the rest of us, we're going to keep singing. Feel free, like I said, to stand up. We're going to do some, um, this is really get your mouths going here, the wonderful grace of Jesus. If you want to stand, please do. Here we go. Wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How shall my tongue describe it? Where shall its praise begin? Taking away my burden, setting my spirit free. For the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea, higher than the mountains, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me, broader than the scope of my transgressions, greater far than all my sin and shame, oh magnify the precious name of As we sing about your grace and its transforming power, God, I just um, just ask for the grace um, that that would land today through the speakers at WGA, through um, the worship, that we would just grasp a little bit more about what even this wonderful grace of Jesus is. We just engage with that. We want to engage with you this morning. Thank you for these kids, the visitors, the people, um, anyone here and, and out there. Just, mm. <laughs> we love you. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to, um, 
We're going to have some announcements now, and then we'll do some more singing. Sorry, I'm hobbly a little bit. Um, apparently, I'm, my ankles are not 20 anymore. So when I walk down the driveway and <laughs> hit a little snag, it takes me a little while to recover. Um, we're going to do some announcements, but before that, I just wanted to share for just a brief moment, because I'm going to ask Heather Carlson to come up and give an announcement about um, just some opportunities to volunteer, um, to serve our kids and our church. And I just thought real quick, um, I was talking yesterday with Allie and talked through something that had just took me a while um, to un even understand. I have always... I would say since I was probably 23, been a very committed disciple of Jesus. I served in China. The God I met when I was in China was bigger and more exciting than I knew that he, had, that he was. And it hooked me. And since then, I have just been a, I, I just, I love, I love Jesus. I can't separate myself from him. However, I was an attender of church. I loved Jesus and was in the theater, and I wanted to um, talk to, you know, be Jesus in the theater community. Um, I wanted to be Jesus in my workplace, and I was happy to attend, just attend church. I didn't really care to be on any committees. I didn't care to um, serve, really. It wasn't where my heart was. Um, and it wasn't until about five and a half years ago where I realized that I loved the church, that I loved the body. And that came through the birth of my sweet girl, May Lynn, when I found that I needed body. I needed Jesus through you. I needed this community during that time. And I found that you came through. Um, you showed love and walked with me. And in fact, you're still walking with me. You're walking with us. You're walking with her. You're teaching her. You're serving her. You're asking about her. You're praying for her. And Rebecca and Dawson, and me, and my family. And yesterday, we had a baby shower here in the church. And once again, the church showed up. Connie, and Lynette, and Jeannie came to this baby shower. And they loved Heather, who is not a part of this church, directly. And she felt that love. And when even her friends weren't, didn't come, you were there. And you showed up. And that meant a lot to her. So I say that before uh, Heather comes up and asks, um, you know, on behalf of CE, talks to you about all the things that are going on. Um, because for me, I would hear that before. And I was like, yeah, not me. <laughs> not interested. <laughs> and then after this shift, I realized, and I... I want to pour into these people and this place because I believe in it as a, the arms and feet, the message of Jesus, which is unique in our world. It is unique in a world of hyper-social media, of a politically infused climate. This message is a beautiful message that we need. So there's my two cents. Heather would you come up and um, talk about what Christianette is doing and some of the needs that we have? Thanks. Can she use this mic? Okay. Oh, good morning. Um, first off, I'll talk about some of the needs that we have in children's church. And one of the things that keeps coming to mind is, um, how many of you have heard the expression, it really takes a village to raise our kids? That's... Um, that's what's in my fore, forethought right now. And I'm calling on you as a village for all of our children. We have needs starting from the beginner's classroom all the way through to the youth group. 
So if it's something that is um, toying with your heart, I really encourage you to pray about it and come talk to me. Um, it's, it might sound overwhelming when we're, when we're thinking about it, when we're talking about it, but we have really been working hard in CE to have a uh, simplified program. We've got great curriculum. It's really easy to read. It's really easy to teach. And it's really so easy to love on those kids. So um, Barb is in need of some help, um, really from first hour through second hour. She needs an, another adult in there. Her class is quite large. So um, she just needs some support, some help if they have to go to the bathroom, um, if she's having trouble moving around a little bit. So that's one of our needs. And then K through second, um, Carl does an amazing job second hour, but we might need a substitute here and there if he's not able to come. And then I teach first hour. I'm the only one right now. So if I could get maybe three more volunteers and we could rotate on a monthly basis. Like I said, curriculum is really easy. You just read through it, you pray, and then it's activities after that. And then um, Children's Church, third through fifth, my mind just went blank. Um, we have Judy, myself, and Katie that are doing that. And then we have Jeannie doing second hour. And, oh, sorry, Jeannie. <laughs> we have a multiple of people. But second hour, we really only got Jeannie that's there. So again, we need a substitute for a time frame when she can't, can't attend. Just somebody to fill in really quickly. The curriculum's all down in the classroom. It's one of my favorite curriculums to teach. Kay did a wonderful job in getting that for us this year. And um, the kids really enjoy it. You go through a lesson and you just draw a little picture so they can kind of um, learn the story that way. Instead of just being taught it, they get to draw it. So that's kind of fun. Um, so think about it, pray about it, and if it's something that is, is sparking your interest just a little bit, reach out to me or anybody on the CE committee and we will, we will plug you in wherever you think you might be interested. Um, and then moving over to just some announcements, we've got some fun stuff planned for the month of October as we round it out. So this Friday night we have a movie night. We're going to play uh, Hotel Transylvania here in the, um, in the sanctuary at 6 p.m. right here on the big screens. And we're going to have some snacks, so that's really for all ages. Um, I know my husband really enjoys that movie, and it is an animated movie, and it's one of the favorite ones that he likes to watch. So I think anybody in this room would like to be there, and we'll have some popcorn and snacks just like we would at a normal movie. Um, and then on October 30th, we're doing our trunk or treat. We had huge success last year. Um, it wasn't just for this congregation, but we had, it was a big community outreach too. So if you're interested in that, if you'd like to do um, show up with a trunk, or if you just want to come and be a part of that, we'd love to have you reach out to Erin Burnett or myself. And um, we will also be doing some Awana fundraising during that time frame. So we're going to have some hot cider, hot chocolate, cookies, snacks, and we'll have some of the Awana kiddos there just to raise some money. So um, exciting stuff. Can't wait to see everybody. That's all I got. Okay. So. Thank you, Heather. grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt, yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled, grace, grace, God
was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, is free indeed. the children of God together say Amen. Amen. As the kiddos get ready to go down with me to Children's Church, um, Mary Huffman is going to lead the next portion of our service as the, boy, let me see, um, the founder of Where Grace Abounds, a ministry that we have supported for how many years, Mary? For 35 years. It's going to come along with um, her team um, this morning to give the message to you in our missions month. Kids, why don't you start by following Heather, and I will bring up the rear. Can we just reach out our hands to these kids and just pray blessing, Lord, blessing your presence, over these kids, downstairs in Children's Church, your life, infusing their lives, informing their minds. Amen. Good morning.
So in preparation for this service, those of you that have been around DFC for a very long time, um, you know that this preparation is ridiculous. Because what I did is I put from 9.30 to 9.32, we will do this. And for, yes, do that again, Sue. That is very appropriate. And from 9.54 to 9.40 to 9.59, we will do thus and so. <laughs> Fortunately, the order is still in order, and I can stall a little bit because Roger is walking his kids down, and he will be back up here in just a minute. Hmm? All ready. <laughs> Since we're all in place. So Denver Friends... Church has, ever since I've been here, which is over about 50 years now, uh, have known that we are part. One of the um, best things is knowing once a year we're going to just really zero in on missions. Um, and we just have a lot. Over the years, we've had so many different opportunities, mission trips, and um, but consistently sharing, partnering with missions. And where Grace Abounds part of that, I believe, if I'm not if I'm not certain, I think we're the oldest ones. Maybe Jay and I might do a little bit of sparring about that, but we have some long-term missions that we have supported, and where Grace Abounds is one of those. We've always understood ourselves as part of the body of Christ that we're to be witnesses to Christ's love, his truth, his grace. We take seriously the directives in Acts 1.8, which says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jerusalem was in those days, in biblical days, when those words were written, Jerusalem was the hometown, the neighborhood, the close proximity to those that were listening. DFC has folks witnessing in various ways here in our own neighborhood. I look across at you. You could be up here sharing all the exciting things about your individual pieces that you do. We have a prayer ministry. We have Celebrate Recovery, Awanas. People write cards to nursing home residents. Feeding meals to folks at the Denver Rescue Mission monthly food distribution right here in our parking lot that went on, by the way, we found a schedule all throughout the whole COVID time. DFC does plenty in our neighborhood, and where Grace Abounds is one that I'd like to zero in on now. You've partnered with us for 34 years, actually, we're starting our 35th year of ministry, and you, uh, the body of Denver Friends, the leadership of Denver Friends, before Where Grace Abounds existed, I went to them trembling <laughs> with a calling on my life and had it affirmed. That's how far back that goes. You have been a part of it from the beginning. We are sent by DFC and our other ministry partners to our city, to our state. We've ministered in several countries as well, but mostly we serve right here in our own neighborhoods. So our WGA staff consists of Roger Jones. You're going to hear from him in a second. Roger, why don't you come on up? Scott Kingry, you're going to see a couple of uh, video clips of his. Uh, Steve Houston is going to be bringing uh, the message. And Steve and Jill, why don't you guys stand up right now so people recognize you when you come forward. This is Steve and Jill Houston. They're part of the WGA staff as well. So Roger... How long have you been executive director now, and what's the purpose of WGA? Do you want the notes? I can hand them out. Will that mic work? Pat, there we go. Um, yes, yeah, so, <laughs> sorry. What was your question again? I got distracted. <laughs> Who are you, and what are you doing oh, here? Yes. <laughs> well, no, it's um, your, the question is, how long have you been with Where Grace Abounds? Yeah. Uh, a little bit about your background and then what the purpose of WGA is. Okay. Yeah, so I came to Where Grace Abounds in 1995. So that's a long time ago. Um, <laughs> um, one of the things I will say I think is kind of cool is that 
Mary often when she shares, she talks about coming to this church, becoming a Christian in 1972, which is the year I was born. And I used to think that was really funny because ha 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 ha, Mary's so much older than me now that I'm a lot older than I was when I first heard her say that. It's not as funny because, uh, yeah. But anyway, I think that that's cool. There, there just seems like a connection there that I appreciate and think of fondly of like, that's kind of the beginning of Mary's call and you know just a faith and that's my beginning as well. So anyway, many years after that, I came to where Grace Abounds and just came as a participant and looking for a place where I could talk about things like sexuality and faith. There weren't really any other places that I found that I could do that. And that's exactly what I found um, at WGA. So thank you guys for your part in fostering that. It had been around for about 10 years, I think, at the point that I came along and pretty well established by then. So that was that was great. Um, just a little bit about, well, I guess, fast forward, I became the I started working for the ministry in 96, very part-time, clawed my way all the way to the top, um, stepped on Mary's head somewhere along the way. And <laughs> no, it's, it's about this far maybe from the bottom to the top. And I still clean toilets, so I don't know what that says. But <laughs> um, So that, tran that transition of me becoming the director took place in 2007. So that's, what, 14 years ago now. Just briefly about the purpose of Where Grace Abounds. Uh, most of you probably know this, but um, our purpose statement says that we exist to guide and support men and women who seek to understand sexuality and relationships and to inspire all people to know and personally appropriate God's plan for their sexuality and relationships. So that's a mouthful. That, um, <laughs> In essence, I think what that means and how we practically work that out is a lot of times the the areas, the ways that people are struggling, particularly in the, with sexual issues or relationship issues, um, they often feel like there's not a place for them in the body of Christ. And so we try to make a, a bridge for the, that group of people so that they have a place where they can talk about those things, hopefully be reconciled with some of those and how um, how they work those out. So it's been a, r it's a real gift to be able to walk with people on that journey. So we have a couple of videos Mary mentioned. Right, if you want to say a little bit about Scott and mm -hmm. those videos, they came from a yeah. talk he did at your church. Yes, so um, just a few weeks ago, Scott Kingry, who's our program director, I'm sure most a lot of you have seen him over the years, he spoke at my church. Get, did a couple of weeks in a row that he was able to share, and he's um, he's been on the staff since 1992, I believe, so longer than me, not quite as long as Mary, <laughs> but close. Um, the years seem less significant the more of them that pass by, I guess, but um, so yeah, it's it, you'll get to see a little bit of his, uh, just a glimpse of his story, and really, I think what's super powerful about Scott's story, f especially for a setting like this in a church, you know, with people who are really passionate about missions and wanting to reach out, is it really was one man who reached out to him that made all the difference in, in his life and his um, pursuit or his return to Christ. Okay, thank you. We're going to have those videos in just a second. One thing I would add about uh, Scott... Um, uh, the clips that we have pulled are right out of the context of his story, just a couple of pieces of what he was saying and how he was saying it, and it gives you a flavor of who Scott Creating is. Creating a safe environment that for men and women who are in conflict with some aspect of their sexuality, that could be uh, their attractions, maybe that same-sex attraction, maybe it's like I'm attracted to someone that's not my spouse, or uh, you know that variety of attractions that might be troublesome. Maybe it's in their behavior. Like, I'm acting in ways that are really incongruent with what I believe about my faith. Um, that could be gender identity, maybe some conflicts around gender. Um, and we also kind of work around issues of, of, with abuse and addiction uh, that's all very multi-layered and all sort of tangled up together. Um, 
So I was really personally glad to have a space where I could personally flail around and try to find out some big answers to big complex questions. Um, and I, I always kind of say this, is, as I said, we work with people that are men and women that are in conflict. And we don't think it's our job, and I don't think it's our job as Christians, if someone's not in conflict, I don't think it's our job to put people in conflict. Whose job is that? God's the Holy Spirit, right? It's the Holy Spirit that moves in human hearts, right? So we just kind of come alongside people. That's what we all do. Uh, and we also have a space for family and friends. So parents who just, I'm trying to figure out how to love my kid, uh, spouses, siblings, just friends that someone has issues around sexuality. How do I love them well? How do I come alongside them? Just a couple things about uh, as ministry partners, we just love collaborating. Just a couple quick things. We have a weekly support group that we hope is that environment, that safe environment that meets every Thursday. Uh, since COVID, like most everybody, we're sort of partially on Zoom, partially in person. And that's been actually kind of cool because we've been able to Zoom people in just probably like you guys are doing. People are Zooming in on Thursdays from Alaska and Hawaii and New York and all over. And that's really awesome to be able to provide some of that support, um, especially during those lockdown seasons, you know. Um, we're mostly hearing from parents these days because one in six Gen Z, that's 18 through about 20, how old is that, 23? And younger, one in six are identifying by some LGBTQ label. Um, and that's like 15.9% of that generation. And that's a big rise because it was only about 9.1 of millennials that are identifying. And when you get down to like my age, I'm sort of on that boomer Gen X edge. It's only about 3% are identifying. So we've seen this rise in that kind of identification. And so we're very busy speaking with Christian youth workers, Save Our Youth, urban youth, and doing training with their people. And uh, we're very busy with a lot of questions around the transgender issue. That seems to be just a lot of questions these days. A lot of people experiencing uh, that. And uh, we just really want to help the church love better. Um, and that's, that's why I just love. And I think the church is wanting to love LGBTQ people well. I've seen, a, I've seen that arise, and I just think that's so great, like just even being here, right? And we haven't had a great track record. Um, you know, when I was growing up in the 70s and 80s, just a lot of the really painful things that were sort of coming from the church at that. So we're going to start with the scripture. Let's see if, um, yes, yeah, so our scripture is from um, 1 Corinthians 5, 16 through 21. So it says, so from now on, we refuse to evaluate people merely by their outward appearances, for that's how we once viewed the anointed one, but, now, no, but no longer do we see him with limited insight. Now, if anyone is enfolded into Christ, he has become an extremely new person, entirely new person, I'm sorry. All that is related to the old order has vanished. Behold, everything is fresh and new, and God has made all things new and reconciled us to himself and given us the ministry of reconciling others to God. In other words, it was through the anointed one that God was shepherding the world, not even keeping records of their transgressions, and he has entrusted to us the ministry of opening the door of reconciliation to God. We are ambassadors of the anointed one who carried the message of Christ to the world as though God were tenderly pleading with them directly through our lips. So we tenderly plead with you on Christ's behalf, turn back to God and be reconciled to him. For God made the only one who did not know sin to become sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God through our union with him. So there's a lot of uh, reconcile, reconcile. <laughs> that word is a, a lot in that. And so I was just was sort of looking that up. And um, in the Latin, it just means to make friendly again. That's sort of the Latin. Um, and some of the, the um, synonyms are the idea of unity, peace, to reunite, to penance, to offer penance, settlement, peacemaking. But you sort of hear it more in sort of the antonyms you hear conflict, estrangement, um, alienation, separation, antagonism. So I think we've all been sort of in those states from God. We've been separated from him. We might have been antagonistic, we've estranged. And I just love sort of this, this passage for a couple of reasons, because it's like, God, that's God's heartbeat. His heartbeat is 
wanting reconciliation. I think about that image of him weeping over Jerusalem and he just wants to gather people, to gather them up like, like a mother hen, like that picture is so tender. That's God's heart, right? And that we, he wants us to participate in that kind of ministry. He wants us to be part of that reconciling work as if we're tenderly pleading his case to other people and the way that we do that. And I just love the idea too that we don't really view people just from an outward appearance anymore. I love that. So there's a lot of things about this passage and we'll sort of talk about that a little bit. Um, but I'm standing here because some gentleman did that for me. There's a lot of people that were praying, I think, but one in particular, I was, um, you know, I was in a very dark place personally. I was angry at the church. I was angry at Christians. Uh, I was using a lot of addictive things to numb myself and my pain. Um, I was confused about my gender and sexuality. And so this man joined me in my story and just started talking about Jesus. And uh, so that's why, if, if you would have told me I would have been here, like when I was like, you know, smoking a cigarette, drinking a Long Island iced tea at the gay club, I would have just laughed, you know. But that's how amazing God is, right? So that's our Scott, Scott Kingry. So I'm just going to go ahead and uh, introduce Steve Houston. Steve's got a few words for us from the family and friends perspective. You want to come on up, Steve? So Steve and Jill have been on staff primarily as coordinators of family and friends ministry, but both of them serve in hospitality for events, leading small groups, discipleship counseling. Steve retired from a career in aerospace. Is that a good general term? Yes, that's right. <laughs> he attained a counseling degree and then a chaplaincy certificate from Denver Seminary. Yes. I didn't double check this with him. Right. None of us trust my memory. <laughs> He and Jill having raised four children, and he and Jill joined as leaders and then on staff at WGA. Steve's sharing a message this morning about how the Lord is a God of comfort and how he comforts us through each other. You're already mic'd up. You don't need this one, right? I, I am mic'd up, yes. Thank you, Mary. Well, uh, Mary, um, as I, um, I want to share about what brought me to WGA. Mary's already given some background on our family. And, you know, I think uh, uh, as I begin, I think about last week as we were in staff meeting and we were talking about today. And um, just uh, as a warning to myself, I said, I did not pay really close attention to James 119. That passage says, let every person be quick to listen and slow to speak. Instead of being quick to listen to Mary, as she talked about today, um, I uh, spoke too quickly, and I kind of volunteered to be the person up here. So, so you know, <laughs> let's uh, pay attention to those verses. So, <clears throat> Well, Jill gave a background on our family. We've um, been married 43 years, and, um, you know, we were, um, throughout our married life, we've been very involved in church ministry, uh, church leadership. Um, we taught classes, and uh, we worked with other couples so that we could kind of help strengthen their marriages. I, in fact, I remember when we had our first two kids, we were in our mid-20s, and we were responsible for 20 couples in our church. So our goal was every year we would go and be in each one of those couples' homes or families' homes and talk to them. So that's just a part of describing of who we are. And so we, as we raised our children, we loved them. We prayed for them regularly. And uh, now they're adults. That's, we continue that. And uh, we pray for our grandchildren in a similar way. But um, um, at the end of our daughter, oldest daughter's uh, freshman year of college, uh, she met a woman who became her roommate for the rest of her college life. And for me, as I saw it, I just saw it as an unhealthy, codependent relationship. Um, my wife was, uh, had much greater insight and intuition. And I'll say, I lived in denial. So, but we worked on loving our daughter, loving her roommate, um, 
throughout their college time. And um, after college, our daughter moved to Chicago with her roommate who was pursuing additional education. Now, I have a funny thing about that is um, our daughter went to school in Texas because she was tired of the cold in Denver. And so then when she said she was going to Chicago, we said, oh, now wait a minute. Chicago is colder than Denver, so anyway. But um, then about uh, two years after graduation, Jill and I went up there for a long weekend, um, which we did periodically. And while we were there, our daughter came out to us. Um, She started reading a a letter that said she had met her soulmate and that she wanted to spend the rest of her life with her roommate. And uh, I remember that time uh, very clearly. Um, as she's reading that letter, we're at a restaurant and I just start internally weeping and praying and say, God, I don't know what to do with this information. And, um, so, um, when we got back to Denver, um, I contacted one of my professors who was now professors from when I was working on my counseling degree. He was now in practice and, um, We talked a little bit and he said, you know, you need to go to where grace abounds. It's a place where they can, would really listen to you. And uh, I'll say that was, that was 16 years ago. So we, Jill and I have been now at where grace abounds for 16 years. And I'll say that um, when I first arrived at WGA, it was just a really dark time for me. And uh, I pulled back from church leadership. I went through a lot of the steps that one would see as going through grief of losing a loved one. Um, But WGA became a place where I could uh, share my sorrow. And and over time, I could see how I was comforted by God, um, by the staff, and by other parents. And... um, so people just listened to where I was. That was, you know, Scott talked about someone just came alongside and listened to him and wanted to know his story. And so uh, for myself, I was uh, learned and grew to become more transparent, which was something that I had maybe avoided in the, in the past. Um, I think a really important thing is I learned to be, uh, become more um, transparent and open with God. Um, I think that was a part where, um, you know, previously I worked really hard to control my emotions, not let things hurt me. And I had blinders on that I wasn't aware of, and that even carried over into my spiritual life. And so I think I, I grew to said, God, I can actually trust you with these hard emotions and when I'm overwhelmed. Um, and, uh, you know, I, as I worked to control things, I missed out on a lot. Like, for example, I remember a time, a season at work when it's going through a lot of stress. And, uh, and instead of processing through the stress and anger that was growing, um, I just bottled it up. And soon afterwards, uh, I broke out in hives. <laughs> so the internalization was not good. Um, but, you know, over time, as God uh, healed my heart through himself and others, uh, and then I started working in the leadership at WGA to minister to other parents, and, um, and then God also led me along the path to get uh, additional training as a chaplain, and I served as a chaplain intern in a hospital, and that was a rich time. And then nine years ago, I retired from... Uh, a job in, aer- in uh, aerospace, and, um, and then Jill and I went on staff shortly afterwards. But so some of the themes as I thought about, I, um, I have uh, 2 Corinthians 1 that I think was a big part of our story that I've come to realize. So I'm going to read it. I, good, it's up there. Thank you, Susan. So blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we may be able to comfort those experiencing any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. And, you know, I think about that was a big part of what our story was as I look back um, to where I was 16 years ago to where I am now. Uh, I was struggling in grief. I think even spiritual disillusionment 
hey, God, I've prayed for my kids. I've loved my kids. Where were you? <laughs> and um, so those are, that's where I was. But, you know, God was big enough to hear that and work through that. And that's where I've grown to be able to trust God in deeper ways. And so that's where now God has me in a place where um, I'm able to come alongside and be present with other parents. Uh, it's an area that I'm growing in, how to learn to be present with God and others. And, and along the way, we just uh, we learn to listen. We share our experiences. And then um, we encourage parents to turn to the Lord and ask for guidance. And... Um, Matthew 22, the, the two greatest commandments, it says, Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? And Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Um, love your neighbor as yourself. And I can see that as I was comforted, then I can also say that my love for God deepened. As I learned that he was trustworthy, that he could handle the hard things that in the past I said, oh no, I got to hold this and manage this myself. And um, I'll say that I'm, you know, I'm now, I'm further down the road than where I was 16 years ago, still a work in progress in that regard. Um, I'm back serving in church leadership, but in different ways. It's probably more of a behind the scenes, which is kind of a little more of my style. Um, so the pastors at our church, we go to a fairly large church. Um, when they hear of people going to our church who have stories like mine, then they say, here, uh, you need to call Steve and Jill, and they'll be ready to talk to you. And so we just come alongside and, um, and listen. Um, I, you know, a lot of times when parents come to WGA, um, they're there for a short season. They think. <laughs> they think, well, I'm going to come here. WGA is going to give me all the answers. I'm going to correct my family, and I'm going to get back on with life. And um, over time, they realize that we don't offer direct answers. But we do provide a ministry of listening, a ministry of presence. And uh, we encourage them to... Uh, Pray to the Lord and say, how do you want to work to lead and guide me? And what I have seen in my own life and I've seen in their lives is um, they hear about other parents and maybe how they're handling relationships and their relationships then start deepening. And um, God starts doing a work in them as parents um, and them as individuals and their, their faith in God grows and um, they grow to love their uh, families in different ways, their children in different ways. It's still painful. You know, I think as I um, look back on our story, um, things are better, and, but it's still, it's, and then sometimes maybe it's worse. It's, it's this roller coaster of, of, uh, that we're living through on relationships. We have some good times. We have some painful times. Um, and uh, so as I think about uh, going back to, um, I think the biggest thing that parents realize and that I realize is I was not alone in my journey. This past Thursday, Mary asked the family and friends group, uh, what gives you hope? What keeps you coming? And the consistent theme was parents would share, um, I realize I'm not alone. There's other parents that are going through what I'm going through. And... Um, and, and they just see my, their faith grows. They're still sometimes, you know, so that's a change that they see. As I go back to that Second Corinthians passage that I talked about earlier, I thought there's a couple of words that really stand out to me, that the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our troubles so that we may be able to comfort those experiencing any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted you know, originally I, I would, this passage was written about the great persecution and arrest that was going on of Christians. Um, I have not been arrested or persecuted in that manner, but, but I have experienced overwhelming sorrow 
and that led Jill and I to come to WGA. We worked through a lot, and, uh, but I see God, how God's faithfulness. And then it's interesting, over the years, we've had opportunities where we felt like God was leading us to share our story uh, out of the context of WGA. And then as we've shared our story, then I see kind of a heavy heart rise up, and they go, hmm, I think you're willing to hear my story now. And, um, and, at, and they realize that we're safe people, that we're willing to be present with them. So there's times I hear some really overwhelming stories. Um, and when we get a call, I go, oh, Lord, I don't know what to do. So we just spend time in prayer. And I think God just reminds us to be present and not working on fixing it. And God wa- asks me, he's to walk alongside individuals. So someone willing to just listen and be a part of things. And um, I think that um, those passages in Matthew 22 of the great, greatest commandment of loving God and loving others, I think it's, um, for me, I was blinded in those areas without really being able to be uh, comforted. And so God comforted and allowed me to do that. And um, I'd say that over the last 20 years, some of the greatest pain in my life has occurred. But I've seen God, been, he's been active in changing me, and I'm very grateful that, for that. And uh, I began with James 1.19, and I think it's a good way to end. If um, It's hard to follow these passages of loving God, loving others, comforting others, if we don't begin by being um, quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Uh, I can't do this without praying um, because I think maybe I would be um, maybe slow to listen, quick to speak, and quick to get angry. So, uh, and that's not a ministry of love or comforting others. So that's what I wanted to share today. Why don't you just stay up here? Okay. Um, Roger, if you and Jill would join us. Um, What I'm hoping is that a few of you would like to come forward and pray for us. Um, Phil, would you lead us in prayer for our, do you mind? Come forward and pray for Word Grace Abounds and maybe a couple of others, a few others that would like to join. Father, as we uh, stand here before the cross, uh, as I recently heard said that uh, the ground is pretty level. We all come with our issues in life, and uh, we are just grateful for your grace and mercy upon us as sinners. We thank you've called us by name into your kingdom, and that each one of us have a different story of how we found you how we found you as the truth and light, that you bring joy and hope into our lives, into our existence. And yes, there's other times when we, uh, we, our hearts are heavy with pain and recognizing uh, relationships are broken. People have trouble finding you. People have trouble believing in you. And I just thank you, Lord, for the door that where grace abound provides for people, as Jeff spoke and Steve, and I know there's many other stories of where uh, people have come to where grace abounds, and they find people that listen and care and uh, share the love of Christ. So, Lord, I pray for this ministry. Uh, Obviously, in these days, uh, there is a growing need, and we just lift up Mary and Steve, Jeff, Roger, we just thank you for their lives. We thank you, Lord, for the ministry they have. We thank you that we as a church can partner with them. We're 
pleased for that opportunity, not only prayer for in our prayers, but financially. And we just, Lord, ask your blessing upon this ministry and pray that as it grows, uh, you might reveal ways in each of our hearts where we could be more aware and involved directly in the ministry. Just grateful to get today, Father, for your goodness. Pray your blessing upon where grace abounds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, thanks, everybody. Um, we really appreciate your interest and your investments in prayer and finances of where grace abounds. And we're done in time for coffee and donuts. Don't ask me the internal conflicts it took me to get us there, but we did it. So thank you. Praise God.